try not to be a sentimental person when it comes to objects. In all of my life, there's only this one object that I've preserved. There's only this iPod touch for a generation. Everything else I've let go or accepted as being transient. But this is an old iPod. It doesn't work anymore, I don't think. It hasn't worked for a really long time. And still I keep it around. Still I use it for sentimental reasons. It's not the world's prettiest object. The screen is broken. It doesn't really show up that well. But in the top right, it's completely full enough. And uh, when I was really young, I just put a bandage on it. And that's, that's the epitome of a band-aid solution. Just fix a fucked screen with a simple bandage and then it's no longer fucked. Yeah, as a kid, I used to lay down on this bed always and I would have this iPod and it would be my only way to have freedom. There's this boomer meme about how getting your car right is what freedom really means, right? There's this meme that if you have a car, right, then you can travel and see the world and experience control over your own destiny, right? But, oh fuck. When I was a kid, that was the least of my concerns. What I wanted to explore was the internet. And that type of was my only unrestricted way to do so. Because I only had a very limited amount of time that I was allowed to use the computer for on a daily basis. This meant that if I wanted to use the internet beyond the heavily limited time, I would have to use my iPod. Now, I don't have any of my old implements here, I don't think. The oldest thing I have is that monitor. It doesn't hold any sentimental value, really. Because it's not what I used when I was really young, but rather what I started using when I first got my real computer, one would say. But yeah, my iPod Touch was for a really long time the only way I could use the internet in a somewhat free way. Now, it still had restrictions on it. My parents discovered they had been looking at porn, so they put restrictions on all of my electronic devices. Not that I couldn't circumvent that, it, it was trivially easy to do so, especially because I was always really tech literate from the moment I was allowed to use technology. I never really had a period where I had to adapt to technology. It, it, it always came intuitively to me. So even when restricted, when I was a bit older, that type of touch was freedom for me. And to this day, since freedom is the most important thing in my entire life, I keep it around. I keep it here on my table while I go online. I experience the internet. I talk to my friends on the computer. I make art. No matter what I do, my iPod touch, the one tiny ember of liberty I had as a kid is just sitting there on my table and it's it's a really important object for me it's a really important memory this could be really obvious to everyone in the Toots Might audience but I feel like I need to go over it to make my next point so in the 90s modernity transitioned into post-modernity, right? Before the 90s, you had these youth movements, like there was a perpetual youth movement. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, right, people went to university, they learned all of these cool socialist progressive ideas, they st started protesting, they started making their voice heard. So there was this permanent revolution where the college students were always these progressive icons, right? They were bringing, like, 
real change to society. They made their voice heard and they had like this tendency to propagate social change in this really interesting way. And there was obviously a reactionary pushback, right, where old people were like, no, here's why we do it the way we do it, right? Look, we're, we're not gonna be socialists. But there was this like dialogue, right? It wasn't a performance. I mean, to an extent it was a performance, but the intent on every side was to decide the direction where society has to go. In the 90s, capital realized that they could sell rebellion, right? Because it wasn't like young people actually wanted to change things necessarily. They just wanted to feel like they were a part of something that was changing the world. So in the 90s, we had things like the alternative rock movement, and it had organic and authentic elements like Kurt Cobain in it. But generally, it was just capital commercializing the grunge aesthetic, or capital commercializing metal music, and so on and so on. So the organic youth movements got replaced by this commercialized, enough, not, not inauthentic, but, but inorganic youth movement. There was no revolutionary element to it, even though that still formed like the backdrop to it, like it was like, oh, we're atheists, we have these like socialist tendencies, but there was no ideological goal, there was no social consistency to it. And the most important part of that threat wasn't that there was, there was this commercialized rebellion, but there was also this commercialized pushback, where the old people went like, okay, this actually non-threatening music like crunch, right, which didn't really serve to challenge existing social institutions in any way that really mattered, right? But it was new, right? It, it was reminiscent of old youth rebellions. So they, as the old people, assumed their uh, role in society, the pushing back against it, right? They they started to form like the um, the committees to get the parental advisory stickers and like albums, right? They started forming these like spectacular pushbacks like, oh, this is crude, this is reminiscent of BDSM, right? This is reminiscent of revolutionary activities that we were a part of. So they pushed back against it. And the spectacle reinforced itself, right? The spectacle reinforced itself. And it seemed like there was an authentic rebellion because now you had old people to go against. Now you had people to rebel against, even when your rebellion was just a commercial product being sold to you. And that is the condition of postmodernity. That is the essence of postmodernity. But the point that I want to make, the unique point, is that 2016 was the last year of postmodernity and the first year of metamodernity. Now I can obviously point out the example that the youth movement at that time was the alt right, right, which was this reactionary movement. It was made of 15 to 20 year olds. They were all like fucking shit posting about fascism with Pepe the Frog images, right? And the old people pushing back against it were like, no, this is too far. This is too reactionary. You need to be less reactionary, right? So the progressive revolution in the midst of the young was just a return to fascism, right, at that point. But that, to me, isn't really a powerful example, right? Because you can, you can explain that by other theories. To me, the more powerful example is the humble white monster, right? The white monster. What is the ideology of this can, right? It's nothing. It's a marketable product. It's a completely white can of monster. It has a text behind it, right? It has advertising materials. But in essence, it's nothing, right? It's just a way to consume caffeine in a can with the least features possible for a monster energy, right? And yet, the white monster is the symbol of subculture, right? It's not just a subculture, it's not like, oh, you're a part of this subculture, okay, we just ironically appropriated white monster. No, if you are a part of the alt-right, you drink white monster. If you're a gamer, you drink white monster. If you're a goth, you drink white monster. If you're a part of any subculture, you drink white monster, right? Or even if you don't drink white monster, you're surrounded by the people who do, and you're surrounded by organic propaganda for the favor of white monster, right? How did this happen, right? So let, let's go back, let's go back, look, look through history at symbols, right? In the age of modernity, the age of modernism, right? It 
challenged these classical notions of what is high class, right? So they took, like, uh, uh, the, the best example is like the Campbell soup cans, right? Where the uh, artist whose name I forget because I'm really bad at names lo looked at his Campbell cans, right? And went like, look, there's beauty in this, right? This object is relevant to people's everyday lives, right? So there's some value in here. And the designs on the cans look cool. And each flavor has a slightly different design. So if I, if I paint all of them, I can like let people see the beauty in this, right? And challenge the classical notion that beauty can only be found in like some profound, uh, profound aesthetic removed from people's everyday lives, right? Then in postmodernity, right, nothing like that existed. It was, okay, if you buy the right product, then you're buying progress, right? Where billionaires became like charitable socialists, right? And there were like these charity lines like, oh, if you buy this pink thing, you're helping breast cancer. Or if you buy this red thing, you're fighting global hunger, right? It, it was this consumption of charity, right? Where charity and uh, contributing to society became a commercialized product that could be sold to people. So the rebellion, right, was just participating in capitalism, right, to, to an extent or other. Like, you had to buy the right albums to be a rebel and revolutionary, right? You had to just buy the right clothes. You, it, it, it was all fucking clusterfuck. It was just capital extending its fucking slimy, infinite tentacles into rebellion. But now the symbol of rebellion is a capital object with no meaning, right? It's a white monster energy. It's just an object that looks slightly interesting. And yet, it is a symbol of rebellion. It is a capitalist object that makes no claims. And functionally, it goes back entirely to fucking modernity, right? It's like a Campbell soup can, right? It's, it's, it's the same thing. But instead of like, okay, here's a nutritious source of food, right? It, here's a food that you can enjoy, right? That the working class can consume in this era of increasing automation and increasing like mass production. Now it's, here's a can of caffeine that tastes kind of decent and has zero calories, right? And that's the meta-modern fucking transformation, right? There's no assumption that you can buy your way out of capitalism, right? There's no assumption that you can contribute to society enough to get rid of capitalism, right? Like, in, in post-modernity, you, you were reaching this conclusion where all the bankers would be socialists, right? All the teachers would be socialists. All the fucking... Everyone important in society would be a socialist, but none of them would institute socialism in any way. As long as they're performing that role, they can no longer enforce any type of socialist action, right? But now, you have people drinking a commercialized product with only value as a source of caffeine and making that into rebellion. Because that is the only way to rebel anymore, is to stop believing in it, is to stop believing in movements, stop believing in fucking the working class commodities, right? And just embrace this disdainful nihilism and revolutionize a fucking can of monster energy. And I do it too. And it's fucking epic. What is a revolutionary in metamodernity? How do you start challenging the status quo? How do you start instituting social change? And the only answer that we have under the current conditions is to just want as little as possible, right? Which is basically the, the ethos of the need, right? Because the need doesn't want a good job, right? The need doesn't want a uh, fucking family, right? What the need wants is to be left alone and to be able to stay in their room for as long as humanly possible. And that is the meta-modern revolutionary, someone who doesn't have enough desires that capitalism can even begin to influence them. Or their desires have to be so antiquated 
and so impossible under the current conditions that capitalism simply can't give it to them, right? So your desires could be having a, a household where only one person has to work, right? That's borderline impossible for young people right now. Capitalism can't give you that, so you might as well be a neat, right? Or your desires might be, hey, look, I just want, I want to be a part of established socialism, right? Or anything like that. It, it just has to be a desire that capitalism can't give you, or the current form of capitalism can't give you. It has to be a desire that is in contradiction to society. You, you can't desire to contribute. You can't desire to change. You can only desire to withdraw. And that's how you perform as a revolutionary. I want to clarify a few things about that previous rant. Because I know, like, no thank you has probably already responded to it in, like, a, his next video or whatever the fuck, right? Where I don't mean to imply that the protest movements in the 60s, 70s and 80s were free of capitalism or they were completely organic. And I don't especially mean to imply that like the music was a non-capitalist endeavor, right? Because bands like the Beatles were the biggest bands and then, then went on to uh, pre-socialism and so on and so on. So th these tendencies have been around before postmodernity, but the specific thing I wanted to point out was the fact that in the condition of postmodernity, there wasn't a music tacked onto a movement. The movement itself became the music because there was nothing else that people could create the movement around at that point, if, if that makes sense. It's been really cold lately and the heating isn't powerful enough to make it completely warm. So I've just been in bed reading because everything else is too cold. So I I would want to get out of bed to record like a proper video with like some actual theming, but it's just way too fucking cold anywhere else. So I wanted to talk about why I chose 2016 as the end of postmodernity. Now, the meat with among you will immediately <laughs> will immediately say that uh, 2016 is the end of post-modernity because Trump got elected. That is not what I'm actually saying. I'm saying that 2016 was the end of post-modernity because Homestuck ended in 2016. Now I know, I know, I know, contrived, contrived. It's not just one factor, it's obviously an entire era. But why do I think that Homestuck is so endemic of that era? And why do I think that Homestuck ending represents the end of post-modernity? Well, it, co it comes down to artistic movements, right? Because when we look at postmodern art, right? I, rather, art in, a po art in the postmodern era, it is all really referential. New forms of expression were incredibly rare, right? Really, the only thing that changed was the invention proliferation of the World Wide Web was the great leap in culture, right? In every other media, or every other medium rather, it all just referenced like old things. That's why we got like all of like remakes of movies, right? That's why we got all of like adaptations of old comic books, like in the Marvel movies and so on and so on. And really culture didn't move forward in any, in any like really, really significant way. Like we had the Harry Potter books, right? Those aren't really like what I would consider to be on par with an artistic movement, even though the young adult literature genre being really relevant in that period of time does constitute an artistic movement to an extent and denying it would be dishonest. <clears throat> I just personally would not put it like, like to, to me that's a commercial movement, right? Because people realize that instead of writing books for older people, instead of writing books for children, the people who were reading were the young adult demographic, right? So they just constructed books around that knowledge during the data, right? I'd say that that's mostly like a response to commercial inputs, which all artistic movements to an extent are. But 
to me, that's like I, I wouldn't consider new metal an artistic movement, even though there was valuable art in it. If if that makes sense. I might just be biased, but I want to talk about Homestuck, so I'm going I'm to talk about Homestuck. The reason Homestuck hasn't been replicated, right, there hasn't been anything else like Homestuck, isn't because Homestuck was uniquely genius, right? It was because Homestuck had this entire pool of depth it could draw from, right? Because Homestuck in itself, in, in the format, in the attitude, right, was directly derivative of the internet in the OOS, right? And that internet, right, was really derivative to an extent of uh, reviewing and critiquing media made in the 90s, right? So this spectrum that Homestuck referenced is the entire spectrum of postmodernity, right? From the insane clown pussy to uh, fucking Nick Cage movies to just the general culture of new crimes, for example. And Homestuck didn't really entice people who were like 25 at the time, right? The Homestuck fandom was really young. It was like 13-year-olds to like 18-year-olds, I would say, was the Homestuck demographic when the comic was publishing and reaching its peak in like 2014, 2015. Or before that, even it reached its peak. Like, that's just when I got into it. Because that's when I was 13. Well, yeah, the, the experience I've had with Homestuck, right, was always that it was young people who were into it, right? And those young people wouldn't have that cultural background, right? They couldn't want to logically reference and repurpose the 90s and the OOs, right? Because their cultural framework started with Homestuck, and Homestuck introduced them to the entire spectrum of postmodernity, right? And to an extent, the, the sim a similar thing happened with like internet underground hip hop, but that's not my area of expertise. That's like uh, uh, Princess Plunderphonics area of expertise, right? That's I, I can't really comment on that, but I, I can I know there was a similar trend with that too. So so it really could not be replicated, right? You you can't make another Homestuck because Homestuck already referenced everything that was cool to reference during the period of time that it was inspired by, right? And what new culture has been created that you can reference in that format, right? Because Homestuck was mainly about using a new format to its full potential, right? Because Homestuck used the format of a webcomic and of flash animations and of community projects, which weren't possible before, right? And it just fully utilized all of those new elements, right, that uh, it, it could. So it's inherently unreproducible. You could make a homestuck in a different medium with different themes, right? But at that point, it's not even homestuck. At that point, it's a completely different thing. Like, I mean, for example, like if you listen to Plunder's albums, like, uh, like various like fucking like light autism, for example, right? You, you you can see all of this influence from like the OO's hip hop scene, right? And really tense hip hop music. But it's not really like. It's not a homestuck. Because it uses the medium of the mixtape, right? It uses the medium of, of music. And even though it has the same sort of referential background, right? It's not this like wide reaching epic that homestuck is, right? And the thing with homestuck that makes it unique is that this type of referential. Uh, referential and reconstructive artistry is impossible in other formats, right? Because if you... Because, like, a webcomic isn't a book, right? Because the rule of a book, right, like what I'm reading right now, isn't to give you an experience inherently, right? The rule of a book, as in pure text, right? is to make you format and focus your thoughts in a particular pattern, right? Like when you're reading a fiction book and you don't have a fantasia like I have, you're seeing like images and you're imagining faces and you're imagining voices and sounds, right? It's not like you're going through a, a form of storytelling that's outside you, but rather you're going through a form of storytelling that's creating things inside you, right? 
the likelihood of web comic, since there are images, right? Since there's, and in home sex cases, home sex cases especially, you're reading chat logs. That's not something you can really create within yourself, right? That's you're reading text that's supposed to be text for most of the duration, right? Like there, there's no voice that the characters are hearing, right? The characters are reading text similar to you. And the images are what's happening, right? And unlike a comic book where it's your responsibility to map out the motion in your head, Homestuck can heavily use GIFs, right, and flash animations, so Homestuck can animate itself for you, right? So it's something that is external to you, so it can get away with references, because if you were reading a book, you would have to reconstruct the references within yourself, and in that point, the references couldn't be to something that you don't know or understand because it could not properly explain them. So even though Homestuck had this really clear artistic philosophy, laid out all of these principles by which you can use the medium of just expressing yourself through the internet to your fullest extent, right? And uh, it just managed to lay out this perfect roadmap. No one would ever be able to replicate because Homestuck already used the medium in the only way that isn't a commentary on Homestuck. Everything you're gonna make after Homestuck can't be derivative of anything else likely, right? Because you're not gonna have the same cultural experience of the 90s and the O's as Hussey did. So when you're copying Homestuck or when you're using the methods that Homestuck introduced to you, you're going to be copying a culture that was influenced by Homestuck, which Homestuck eventually started doing right itself. Right? Homestuck eventually became a commentary on the influence of Homestuck. So even Homestuck couldn't avoid this. And just the fact of the matter is that just forming a commentary or derivative of or referential thing based on just one thing isn't ever going to work out that well, right? And creating your own original ideas to make for a completely new original thing is never going to be able to reach the scale that Homestuck was able to reach. Because there's an element of cultural consciousness, right? And there's an element of not only relatability, but rather a, a degree to which people can keep up with an idea, right? That you're never going to reach when you create something completely original, right? Like, there, there are a bunch of sci-fi books that fall victim to this, right? Where it's like, oh yeah, I'm using the blip blop, the blap blap, right? And uh, that creates a Mac 500 uh, pseudoplast or whatever the fuck, right? It At that point, it's just a jumbled mess of words, right? You, you can't really comprehend it. And there are sci-fi books, obviously, that, like, uh, manage to use these things, but that's only because they tell really, really human stories. So, to an extent, you can't create anything like Homestuck. It's just not possible. It's a one-time thing. It's something that you can experience once and then can just kind of have to move on from, right? But Homestuck was a youth movement, right? And it intersected with everything that was going on at the time, right? It intersected with, like, the rise of podcasts, it intersected with the rise of YouTube, right? It, it intersected with, like, cosplay, right? Everything new and cool that was becoming popular when Homestuck was becoming popular got integrated into the culture of Homestuck. So it was really a movement, right? It was really a movement of derivativity, to an extent, right? Which is just the natural conclusion of postmodernity. Because if you remember when... Uh, I mean, I'm assuming you're around my age, right? So if, when we were kids, right, when we were like 12, 13, 14, right, it was 2015, 2016, somewhere around that time, right, at the end of postmodernity, we had grown up to a point where we could start creating art, right? But throughout our formative experiences with art, we had seen all new forms of art criticized and relentlessly discredited, right? And everything by the time that we were able to create art had been reduced to the ontological and referential state 
that whose modernity inherently is in, right? So YouTube series had become TV shows, right? Podcasts had basically become radio plays, right? Music, like the internet music of that era, was basically breaking down, right? There, there, during that period of time, right? The underground music was back from back to coming from like the people who lived on the streets, right? It, it was again like street shit was the only way to really like make music at that point in time. And uh, what we were left with, right, was this artistic state where all of the movements that were a part of postmodernity had ended by the time that we reached our like artistic potential, right, where we could start creating art. It was back to the professional standards of late modernity and early postmodernity, right? And there was no more room for a youth movement. Because, again, the people who were making these things, right, they, they weren't like young people. When young people tried to make anything at that time, they were ridiculed, right? So we, we had grown up watching like 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds, right, try to replicate modernity. And everything that wasn't that, right, just was considered cringe, was considered lame. And when we got to the point where we can make art, we can only Im- we could only imitate adults, right? We couldn't create our own movements. We could only imitate because the imitation was uh, posited to us as the only form of valid creativity. With the one exception of Homestuck, because Homestuck didn't imitate anything, right? It was still ontological. It was still derivative. But it wasn't a direct imitation of anything that came before it had this wide perspective, it had this broad range of references, and it was the only real inspirational thing, it was the only thing that, like, at least I personally could cling on to it, like, it's like, I can still create something new and cool. And once we had embarked on whatever artistic direction, like, we had, right, like, I know for a bunch of people it was making YouTube videos in the style of their favourite millennial YouTubers, right, and for me it was writing fucking fascist literature, as I've been over before. It was reduced back to copying certain things that, like, the uh, postmodern ontologies were based on, right? And when we were doing that, right, metamodernity had started, right? And metamodernity started as a void, right? Because everything about postmodernity had been fucking not cut short, but inevitably, uh, inevitably ended, right? Because postmodernity is entirely ontological. So every movement within postmodernity had to inevitably end so it could start again. And metamodernity started, started entirely as a void, right? Metamodernity started as an experimentation with no source. Like, I, w- I would consider, like, uh, Digi's fucking insomnia analysis type vlogs to be a part of meta modernity, even though they that's somewhat of an unfair uh, characterization, right? Because th- those vlogs were still really influenced by a lot of postmodern ideas, right? But the way they were constructed was meta modern, right? I- I'm-, I'm sorry, I'm making a really convoluted point at this point. I I, I, I wish I could explain it in, in a more straightforward, narrativized way, narrativized way, but I, I don't think there's a narrative that can embody all of it, right? So, yeah. But yeah, in, in that time too, right, the end of, like, the street era of music was just a foot, right? And the next musicians that were gonna, like, really pop off, like, in, in a new and unique way, were all kind of considered to be shit, in a, in a way, right? except by the internet to an extent, right? So the internet was the entity in charge of appointing musicians, right? But the internet at that point, right, there wasn't any really cool things on the internet left. So it was just like, oh, these are Reddit musicians, right? Like Post Malone, like, oh, Redditors like Post Malone, or uh, Twitter fucking stands like K-pop, right? 
so the direction of music was starting to become directed by the internet, right? It was, it was still ontological, right? Post Malone wasn't terribly unique, right? Post Malone was just kind of a pop singer with some hip hop influences, right? And K-pop is just pop music from Korea, right? It also was with some like pop and hip hop influences. But they weren't really lineages of postmodernity at that point. They were influenced by it, right? But the people who were who would be influenced by those people would in turn not be influenced by the postmodern ideals that derived from a sense of like modernity. So then now we're getting this generation of kids, right, who are making music that's derivative of this, like, this meta-modern ideal, right, where, like, as No Frankie said in, in Tidbits, right, the avant-garde are making pop music, right? Why are the avant-garde making pop music, right? Because the idea that pop music could be made by the avant-garde has previously been so impossible but now in a state of meta-modernity, when just uh, the internet, right, to an extent, is pop music, the avant-garde are inherently going to be pop music. And it just happens that when you are pop music, you make pop music, you know. There, there's no offline avant-garde because there's no offline anything other than old people. If that makes sense, right, so... I'm not saying that we need to leave the internet behind, right? That's that's not really my statement here. But my my statement is that in in a meta modern condition, we are going to experience like this fundamental. I don't want to say like a fundamental return to modernity, right? I don't want to say that we're going to return to modernity, but the icons of modernity will be twisted in a way that postmodernism never could, right? Because even though postmodernism can deconstruct, right, it can't really just sincerely create icons. So someone like O.S. Quinn, right, isn't like a postmodern Katy Perry, but it's more like a modern Beatles, right? So it's it's still like of the times, right, it's still, uh, it's still not really interesting, right, but it's something novel based on existing musical styles, right, it's, it's something novel in such a commercial and pop way, but in a sincere way, right, it doesn't really have a grand narrative message, right, it's just, oh, hey, here's, here's this person who's, like, during the Beatles time, right, oh, what, what was the, Glamorous existence, right? It was just so we are pretty white boys from the UK, right? That that was a glamorous existence. But like, oh, Queen is like, oh, look here, here's a uh, uh, here's a person of color who's a trans woman, right? That's current like the glamorous existence to an extent, right? And uh, that OS Queen is basically the Beatles, but but obviously you can you can sense all of these differences, right? You can you can sense all of this like. Uh, circumstance that surrounds both of these phenomena that do not resemble each other, like, in any way. But that's that's what metamodernity is, right? It's it's resemblance without commonality, right? It's it's a echo of the modern in a distorted like okay, he, here's the fucking here's the best analogy, right? You you know fucking a hundred kicks fucking drums, right? They go like bow, right? That's that's like a fucking distortion. That's that's that that's exactly what meta modernity does to everything, right? Everything is just a hundred kicks drums forever. That's meta modernity until it ends, at least. And we just kind of have to live in it. I mean, we don't have to live in it. We can exit exit. That's the whole point. But like. It's 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 all gonna be like that, right? There's not gonna be like, okay, I'm on my iPod, I'm at school, I'm refreshing Homestuck to see what the newest chapter is because I really like Frisk and uh, the jokes are funny and I'm learning all of these things about like tropes that I didn't have an idea of before, like time travel and parallel universes 
and like fucking causality loops and like all of this old culture and these uh, social interactions that I couldn't have at that age yet, right? Like, it, that's, that's not going to happen again, right? That's not going to happen again. Everything is going to be sparkly and warped and quintessentially resembling the, uh, the fucking modern trends in culture, right? Like, you're just going to have fucking people put out in the court of the Crimson King, but with, like, fucking synths that sound wacky or whatever the fuck, right? It's, it's, it's all going to be the same thing, but just... Wow, well, it's different this time. It's, it's, it's not. You know what the fuck I'm saying at this point. I don't need to repeat myself. It's, it's a horror. It's an existential horror, and there's no way, there's no way to participate in it without succumbing to the fucking Cthulhu that's in the heart of all of it, right? But it's not like postmodernism was any better. It's not like modernism was any better. Especially not like fucking classical art was any better, right? There's never going to be a sp- place for the avant-garde in popular consciousness. There's never going to be a place for anyone who isn't a part of the era to be a part of the era, right? It's just that the avant-garde of previous eras was cooler, right? The avant-garde of like the 60s, 70s, 80s is contrasted against the mainstream in those eras, right? And with the benefit of hindsight, right? Those are the cool people, right? Right now, the the cool people, right, are always going to become more and more mainstream because they, they are just easier and easier to commercialize. So our conceptions of the cool are always going to be tied to, like, fundamentally conservative ideas. So just, just basically, fuck being cool, fuck being cool. Just desires will always be used against you. Capitalism feeds off of desire. Capitalism feeds off of unnecessary wants. The only escape, right, the only escape, as it has always been, is just to make art with your friends and just just to have fun with your friends, right? Because, like, the avant-garde fucking fringes of previous eras weren't people who were like, oh, we're going to be avant-garde fringes. To an extent, they were, right? Because they hated, like, the conventional culture that, that was considered respectable, right? But essentially what they were doing was just just making cool art with friends, right? It, it, or just just collaborating with each other in, in ways that they thought was cool. And that just managed to fucking put them outside the mainstream, right? And their only commentaries in hindsight, right? Their, their only avant-garde novelties with the benefit of retrospect. You can't meme yourself into being cool because memes are inherently just going to be a capital fucking product, right? It's memes are a commodity. That's that's the important part. Every meme is a fucking commodity. So me and my friends on the Craftsack channel, right, we have Let's Plays. We have this four part Let's Play that isn't really a Let's Play, it's just it was just an excuse to basically make a podcast and <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 avant garde, it's it's gonna it's gonna then we had this Twilight Princess Let's Play that uh, had a pretty long run time. And uh, it, it, it's been fun, right? I've made a few Let's Plays on my own, right? I made my OSRS Let's Play that had to be killed because the, it just didn't didn't work out. I wasn't having fun with it, right? I had re- yeah, here. So I had my OSRS Let's Play here when the Trailblazer League was going on because I thought it would be fun. It wasn't. Then I had my Minecraft Let's Play for a while, and uh, yeah, I just stopped being fun after after a while. It's it's still one of my favorite things I've ever made. I, I think it's I think it's a great Let's Play. It's just not something I could have fun with alone anymore. Like I, I might make a second Minecraft Let's Play at some point, but it would have to be with someone else. It couldn't just be something I I do alone. But yeah, I've made Let's Plays, I've been a part of Let's Plays, and ultimately, I love Let's Plays, right? My favourite genre of YouTube video, like, no offence to any of my friends, right? But my favourite genre of YouTube video, right, absolutely, by far, isn't the Denpa vlog, right? Because I love Denpa vlogs artistically, right? I respect them more than anything else, but when it comes to what I want to watch, it's 
fucking OSRS Let's Plays, right? And OSRS Let's Plays are an example of one of the few types of Let's Plays that can still survive and prosper to an extent, right? Like Game Crumb style Let's Plays, where it's just like about the comedy, not really about the game, can survive, right? Have survived. But there are a niche product now. There, there's something people like making more than people like watching. Because re remember back when uh, Let's Plays were like first becoming things and like the old people were, were like, oh, why would you want to watch a Let's Play when you could play a game, right? Where the fact of the matter is that we were kids, we couldn't have every game. So we wanted to watch Let's Plays of games that we couldn't play, right? I, I watched like a Super Mario Sunshine Let's Play from start to finish. Because I couldn't play Super Mario Sunshine, right? There was there was no way to play Super Mario Sunshine for me, right? I would need a console, I would need to buy the game. So my best option was to ju just watch a Let's Play, and the same applied to most games. But the exceptions that have survived to this point, right, are Let's Plays of sandbox games, right? Like, like when you look back at, like, early Oxcast videos, they're fucking terrible, right? Like, they're, they're not offensive, right? They're not boring, but just they don't really take advantage of Minecraft, right? When you look at later Yorks has Let's Plays, like Shadow of Israel, I think, maybe the Shadow of Israel came first, I don't fucking know, but they, they did a lot of really cool things with, with the Minecraft Let's Play, right, eventually. But from that, right, we have things like the Hermitcraft Let's Play, right, which is which is one of the biggest Let's Plays of all fucking time now, right? It's just, just this fucking insane Let's Play, right? Because these are not demonstrations of a game, but demonstrations of your own creativity within a game. And the same applies to OSRS uh, Let's Plays, right? Because OSRS, even though it's an MMO, right? Even though it's supposed to be like an RPG, it's a sandbox game, right? There, there are an infinite ways, amount of ways you can approach it. And the Let's Plays that people really love isn't just, oh, I'm going to play the game the normal way. People people like the Let's Plays that take like a unique twist on the game. Now, there is an exception, right, which is the uh, playing RuneScape properly series, right? Which was really popular, right? And which didn't have any gimmicks. But it was the only Let's Play of its kind, right? And even though it didn't have any gimmicks, right? Other than playing RuneScape properly. What ended up happening is that the route this person took of just playing the normal game was really interesting and unique, right? Like, uh, for example, he used one of the best money makers in the entire game, which is selling services in Barbarian Assault, which is a minigame. People don't really like it. So they pay, pay hundreds of millions. So other people would basically carry them, right? And that's how he made a lot of his money through his Let's Plays. Let's play, rather. And uh, that, that's, that's why that was appealing. That was, that's why that was so popular. Because that, that was unique. When everyone else was unique, he just made a normal account and managed to make that unique, right? And I mean, there are other series that are more normal, I guess. Like, free, uh, this, this is a decent Let's Play, right? It's, it's free to play the main and then free to play the max, right? But this has a really clear uh, appeal, right? Where free-to-play players can, like, start watching it. Like, it has that appeal, like, oh, how do they make it out of free-to-play? Because you can earn your way to the members' fucking part of the game. And it's really tedious and, and annoying, right? But the best way to do it is basically just... Like, all the best ways are exemplified in this series, right? So it's like... It's it's half a guide, half a YouTube series. And that's, that's what this series was like somewhat successful and then there's also like Plain to Main which is one of the most iconic RuneScape YouTube series right but this was kind of the first of its kind like no what Eviescape was kind of a visionary when it came to RuneScape progress series right no, no one else had really made a series quite like his when he made it and that's that's why he could get away with it, right? Like there there were Iron Man series before Eviescape, right? There were really good series, but like the 
type of theatrical director, the type of storytelling was kind of pioneered by Evie Scape in, in, all the, in a lot of ways, right? It's like, he's not like an OG, he's not an, an original. But I think people don't put enough respect on his name because he's, he's been kind of cringe recently, right? He hasn't, he hasn't really made anything that special, right? But like, it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that people who make RuneScape videos love Evie Scape, right? He's 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 kind of like fucking like MF Doom but way less good. <laughs> like he's he's your favorite Runescape, favorite Runescape video creators, favorite Runescape video creator kind of. If that makes sense. Except he wasn't ever that good. Like he he yeah. Anyway, putting all that shit aside. The the part I wanted to talk about <laughs> before going on this fucking long rant was the ontology of OSRS YouTube series because I, I've been on a ontology wave recently. I've, I've been dabbling in some ontologies, right? I've been thinking about ontologies and RuneScape YouTube is just pure ontology, right? Because when Let's Plays were happening, right? When, when the Let's Play like genre was taking place, right? There wasn't a real RuneScape Let's Play genre, right? Because at that point, Let's plays of like more sandboxy games weren't really like the main wave, right? And then the Minecraft Let's Play wave started, right? And RuneScape was kind of dying at that time, right? So no one was really like that interested in RuneScape anymore. But then, oh fuck. Yeah, as I was saying, RuneScape went through a massive revival with old school RuneScape, right? Because it was a nostalgia game. Now, it, it, in hindsight, right, old school was such a, a small and specific thing, right? It was it was a relaunch of a six-year-old, like, of a version of the game that was live six years ago. But it was just at the perfect point, it was at the perfect place. And it, it managed to just start steadily increasing in popularity. And then enough time went by, right, and it just became one of the best games that is available and is combined with being a nostalgia game, right? And the YouTube scene for it was bound to just pop off, right? There, there was no way that RuneScape YouTube wouldn't become an art form in itself, right? And wouldn't be a genre of YouTube videos. So what ended up happening, right, was that there was this giant revival of like RuneScape YouTube to an extent. But this time, right, we had like the context of Let's Plays, which had also died before kind of like the format of the let's play was dead and then they combined the like grindy sandbox let's plays of like that minecraft had kind of like gotten to although this might have been unintentional right because like a lot of like early let's plays like uh for example if i look at chili's channel right his early let's plays are really just stream highlights right so the format they take like, it, he was around before he escaped. He's like one of the really, real OGs, right? He, he was making videos back in 2015, right? But these are just, these are stream highlights at first, right? There wasn't really concrete genre. And then when Iron Man came out, he made an Iron Man series, right? And that was kind of popular because Iron Man series were uh, really interesting for a certain period of time. And now he's back making just like this fucking masterpiece of editing right which is again like an i'm, I'm not gonna go in depth about it I, I might go on a rant about editing in the future but th this one is already long enough but yeah anyway right it's a ontological format for a nostalgia game right so it, it's just this confluence of ontologies but it manages to create something original right it manages to create an alternative ontology kind of right if if all of these cultural suppositions had been around independently, right, and at different times, it, it could have created, like, a different outcome, right? But the only reason why RuneScape Let's Plays are a thing is because Sandbox Let's Plays happened, right? Let's Plays died, RuneScape got brought back, right? And then this just fucking combination of events managed to create the format that to me, is is the perfection of YouTube to an extent, because because I really like Let's Plays and the the type of Let's Play I've really liked always is like 
it's it's like the sandbox is slice of life type let's play like like e even before i was into like uh, minecraft let's plays there was this guy banana pile or it is kind of left internet from all i can tell but to me like he's he's incredibly nostalgic right it, it, it's this channel it, it was never like really giant or anything but like he was the first person i was a proper fan of like he had this like, really iconic little inferno let's play to me he had a Minecraft Let's Play that was kind of cool, but like, to me, the best Let's Play he ever made was the Animal Crossing Let's Play. Uh, this, yeah, it's, oh, oh, it's still around. Oh, fuck, I thought it was taken down. I think it went up again. Damn. Wait, did he put his old videos back up? Oh, fuck, I think he, I think he put his old videos back up. Holy shit, I remember scrolling through his channel and being like, there's nothing here, but holy shit, I was, I was just planning to talk about something I'm nostalgic for, I wasn't expecting to actually get this nostalgic, Jesus fucking Christ, damn, but yeah, anyway, does he have a Twitter, is his Twitter active again? No. But yeah, he's um <clears throat> Oh jeez. Uh, yeah, this this let's play. I, I thought I thought it was lost forever. <laughs> when, I, when I was a kid this was the best thing because he just put out a long let's play every day that was just him playing Animal Crossing, right? And it was this like slice of life sandboxy thing and that's that's always been my favorite thing. And uh yeah, it seems like he put it up like around a month ago. Or and he had it down for a few years maybe. I don't know. But it's just fucking Like I had a Twitter account. Wait, maybe Maybe I was thinking of maybe the one I'm really nostalgic for is the nah, I don't fucking care. I don't fucking care. But I had a Twitter account that was like a fan fan account for banana pile or it right and it was like it's like a whole fucking thing do you have a new leaf let's play before he had a uh this let's play i don't fucking know because the timeline doesn't add up in my head but i don't really care but yeah, he, he he made like all of these fucking let's plays and he yeah he, he really made like these really sandbox really interesting let's plays and that that was his thing and he he's still really really nice oh man he has a world of warcraft let's play i i never knew about it like yeah he just starts from like this is formatted like a runescape let's play would be i guess i think i mean he just starts from the start and then he keeps going and damn yeah this is a fucking piece of history i thought was lost I... Damn, fuck. Yeah, he's making videos back up. Back again. He's making videos again. Oh no, he got hacked, I think, maybe? I don't fucking know. I don't know what's happening exactly. Anyway. His videos are back up now, and I'm really happy. Jesus fucking Christ. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, like, um, RuneScape Let's Plays are just fundamentally the same format as, like, a Let's Play like this would be. To me, that's always been my favorite thing, and... Oh, my fucking thoughts are just completely disarrayed. I, I thought it was gonna fucking go on a actual fucking... Actual fucking... I didn't even remember anyway yeah let's play ontology runescape ontology it's this <laughs> well, the, the unique confluence of historical influences managed to accidentally create a new form of art <clears throat> which combines like elements of like slice of life and uh, like uh, shown and type progression and it's, it's just happened to be the perfect format for a perfect game. 
neither of which were perfect at the time that they were both relevant. And it's this atemporal sequence of events to an extent that's only possible because uh, things have been things have been ontologically altered, right? It's, it's like something from an alternate timeline, except the future East alternate timeline, right? The, since the past is repeating, we're seeing convergences, right, of different things that happened in the past coming together in unique and interesting ways that are sometimes even more interesting than what happened during the actual past, right? So we're going through like alternate history LARPing basically on a continuous cycle. And it's all just going to result in just future like like for example if you've noticed like the term flaming is coming back in like full force, right? It's like kind of like a boomer thing to say for a while. And I've been saying it for fucking my whole life because I I just happen to pick like, oh okay. I'm I'm just gonna use it, the terms I learned in like learned were a part of historical internet discourse, right? Okay, people used flaming. Okay, I'm gonna use flame, but like flame, the terms like flame wars and flaming, right, and so on and so on, have come back into the common parlance in like a, a really significant way, right? But now they're used to fucking talk about things in like the context of like fucking people getting cancelled and so on and so on and so on, right? And people getting cancelled, looping back to the previous rent, right? Where I uh, I kind of grew up on Tumblr, right? And I kind of grew up in like the homestuck culture in Tumblr, which was fascinating enough, one of the least dramatic, uh, dramatic parts of homestuck. Not homestuck, Tumblr, right? So I grew up in, on Tumblr. My first friends, who were like real friends, were from Tumblr, right? I... Uh, I found community on Tumblr and I could always intuitively use Tumblr because it was all organized based on intuitive subsections, right? You had tags which had all the posts that were marked as being a part of a specific topic. You had uh, you had blogs which were all just everything a person posts or likes enough to reblog, right? And so everything was categorized in clear ways, right? Because every fandom had like a specific tag they used. Every blog had like a bio and oftentimes like multiple pages of bios. So ultimately what ended up happening, right, was the, uh, was the fucking uh, ability to artistically organize the contents of that site in your brain. Or rather, the way I categorized things intuitively matched up to the way that the site was laid out. And that uh, ended up meaning that uh, fucking uh, a, lot of, a lot of the people in that site were used to really insular communities, right? Because everything was strictly categorized and when you were saying something, you were only saying it to the audience of people who follow you and the tag that you post something in and potentially if people reblog you, the audience of those people of those people who are likely going to to some degree overlap with your audience, right? So all the drama on Tumblr, right, all all the statements that were inflammatory, right, were expected to not be met with any type of real pushback, right? Because what what would end up happening is only the type of people who were a part of your community would see your post. So sometimes you had like people from the outside coming in and being like, yo, what, what a fucking retard, right? But but generally you were interfacing with, with your own community and really no one else. So that, that ended up meaning that, uh... oh, is this where I found T3C for the first time? Yeah, this is where I found T3C for the first time. Holy fucking shit. Holy fucking shit. I, I, okay, okay. This is my, the most nostalgic Minecraft map for me by far. By fucking far, right? And uh, this Minecraft map, right? 
I have tried to track down where I found it from for such a long time. But apparently those banana pilots, everything I'm just nostalgic for it just comes from banana pilots, it seems like fucking. Because T3, see that, uh, that's a fucking Minecraft map, I've, I've played it on my channel, it's in an unlisted live stream I think by now. Or maybe it's in a listed live stream, but I, I, can, I can go on my YouTube channel, I can go on my live streams, right? I played this map, yeah it's unlistened now. And I played this map on, on a live stream because I'm uh, I'm I'm really nostalgic for it. Oh, it's TPC, yeah, yeah. Um, but but yeah, this is this is fucking. And that's where I fucking found it from. It's it's all fucking banana pilot. It. it all comes back to fucking banana pilot. But yeah, fucking Jesus fucking Christ. Damn. This is a fucking trip. This is a fucking trip. Well, <laughs> uh, what the fuck was I saying again? Oh, fucking! Okay, before I get to anything, right? Like, you, you know how I went on a fucking tangent. Uh, how I introduced this video by talking about my fucking iPod. You know where I watch this guy's videos on, right? Yeah. It's this fucking, I used to lay in that bed, right? I used to have my iPod touch with me, right? And I used to, used to just fucking watch this guy's videos in secret because if my, my parents didn't like me using fucking electronic devices. The fucking hell. Fuck. Uh, but yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I had this entire video planned out. I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a planned out fucking video. It's gonna be like fucking, it's, it's got. I, I rehearsed things, right? I don't fucking rehearse things, but I, I rehearsed things, and now I'm just oh, I'm suddenly fucking overwhelmed with nostalgia, out of literally nowhere. But yeah, <laughs> yeah like uh, so when the people from Tumblr. <laughs> Migrated away from Tumblr, right? They acted as if their their people they were talking to, right, were still the people who wanted to see what they're saying, right? So they still acted in like these inflammatory, annoying ways. Except, right, now they're reacting that way towards the entire world, and not just the audience who wanted to see them, right? And like, uh, I fucking. You know, <laughs> but yeah, fucking, and and this this has caused like all of the fucking problems in the current evolution of like internet culture, because Tumblr itself was like somewhat performative, in in the way it was laid out, right? Uh, Tumblr, like uh, when when people on Tumblr dramatized things, right? They were expected to automatically believe them. Except when they were revealed to be frauds, which happened constantly. And that was this shocking trauma every time. When most of the time there were like really, really clear warning signs there for absolutely everything that would happen, right? So that that culture of like traumatization uh, then spread out to fucking fucking the rest of the internet, right, when Tumblr died and people from Tumblr migra migrated to everywhere else, right? And now you have this, like, uh, spectacle that's been built, right? We are supposed to traumatize things, but not for insular communities, but for the entire world. And, pe and this is a really easy meme for people to fall for, right? This is a really easy meme to believe. Because when you traumatize things, right, what what ends up happening is that you create like these really compelling narratives, because that's that's appeal of traumatization is you're creating really compelling narratives with heroes with villains, right? And uh, you have this uh, really uh, really involved, really in depth overview, right? Of of everything that's happening in in this like really traumatized way, right? These these are like the trauma channels, right? These are like the fucking the Twitter types, right? It's it's all this just it's all this really heavy fucking uh, fuck. It's it, 
this is all it's all really spectacular, right? And that culture made sense when it came to just saying things that they're intercommunity trauma, right? But trying to solve the entire world's problems by fucking being like, yeah, I'm um, fucking uh, you're problematic, and here's why. I'm I'm gonna start fucking doxing you, <laughs> right? Like, like that that only makes sense when it's all people who are on the same page, right? It's still shitty, it's still awful, but it it has some type of strategy that applies to it. It it doesn't work outside that context, right? It doesn't solve anything, but it feeds into itself, right? It creates a culture where everyone is just dramatizing everything. And you arrive at conclusions that uh, will inevitably just not help anyone, not solve anything, but be appealing to follow. I hope this fucking makes sense. I don't know if it does. I, I'm so fucking distracted right now. Recently, I've been realizing more and more that I'm an adult. It's been a... Like it's, it's not something anyone intentionally does. It's something that necessarily creeps up on you. And uh, I think for me it crept up faster than before. Or faster than for most people. Because I started LARPing as an adult way before I became one, right? It was like when, when I was 15 I moved out on my own, right? And then I traveled the world and I lived with my boyfriend and so on and so on and so on, right? So I LARPed as an adult way before I actually was an adult. And then when I turned 17, I was about to have a horrible year. And most of that year, 2019, is lost to depression. And uh, when I turned 18, I turned to alcohol. So most of 2020 is lost to alcohol. I still had 2020 as a year at least. 2019 was just me wallowing in my self-pity. <laughs> but all the all the process from becoming a young person to a legal adult, right, wasn't something I really experienced. Because the distinctions are always so blurry for everyone, but I feel like they were blurrier for me than for most. And only a few days ago I realized that I am an adult, right? Like, it, it really started making sense on an intuitive level. But what does being an adult mean? What does what does it mean to have the social role of an adult, right? There, there, there's no objective definition. It's a made-up category, right? It's not like anyone has the right answer for what an adult is. But to me, an adult is one who is allowed to solve their own problems. And maybe for some people, it's someone who's expected to solve their own problems. But I never wanted anyone else to solve my problems and it's only as an adult that people have tried have stopped trying to solve solve them for me. And uh, especially recently. So I'm an adult now, I guess, and I'm realizing that to an extent there were benefits to being a kid because I, I've, I've made videos before where I was like, oh, look, uh, look, I, I know a lot of people have like this desire to be a kid again and have a sense that childishness or the wonder of childhood, right, was something that they really appreciated, right, and it was something that they really wanted to return to. But I never had any desire like that because like, I, I never viewed the world in, in like a naive way, even as a kid, right? I, I didn't think that people were there for my benefit, even when they were. But I was always really uh, unusually cynical. So being a kid just felt like oppression to me, just constant, non-stop oppression. And the only things I had to look forward to were growing up. And the only things that I... Uh, I really appreciate that it was when people treated me like an adult. But there's an extent to which the novelty 
you get the experience is really decreased when you're an adult, right? And for me, this has been happening for a really long time. Like, everything I like right now, everything I, I'm a huge fan, right? And uh, I'm obsessed with are things I liked as a kid, right? Like, RuneScape, fucking YouTube, fucking... All, all of this, right? Has just been a constant thing. Like, the games I play are most the games I played as a kid, right? Like, like The Binding of Isaac, for example, and really into now. There are some exceptions, right? There are some exceptions, like... Hollow Knight and uh, uh, Bloodborne and so on and so on, right? But like, they're very few and far between, right? Like when I got into Digi, that, that was a novel experience, but like, it it wasn't as life-changing for me as it was for a lot of other people. But now I'm an adult and that's just the reality. And the younger you are, right, also, the easier it is to judge people for, hey, why why don't you like the new thing, right? Oh, uh, oh why, why are you listening to old music from when you were young, right? Why are you so attached to these things that existed when you were young, right? And I'm, I'm already that, right? I don't really care for anything new, right? I'm not, I'm not really in tune with, like, oh, fucking any contemporary culture. And to me, I thought, oh, I never was, right? That's, that's just a feature of me, right? I'm... I'm not I'm not hip with the kids. I was never hip with the kids. But what I don't realize is that when I was a kid, right, when I was growing up, it was hip not to be hip with the kids. <laughs> it, it was really hip to just LARP as a millennial and, or LARP as a boomer, right? That, that was what everyone was doing, right? And I wasn't unique in any way for doing it. So... So, yeah, and... Now I'm getting less and less attached to those experiences. I just want to play the same games, listen to... I mean, I'm not going to listen to the same music, right? But no matter what comes out, I'll still fucking love Johnny Hobo, right? And it's like, no, nothing can change that, you know? But time is leaving me by increasingly, right? It's it's what happens to everyone. It's, it's what people go through. And... It's just happening at like an accelerated rate at this point. I'm, I'm gonna take, I'm, I'm gonna take a sip of monster. <laughs> yeah, I ran out of caffeine pills. And the store closes later than the uh, apothecary, I guess, is the word where you get caffeine pills from. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting more and more attached to the old. I'm getting more and more attached to the way the world was when I was a kid, right? Like I... When someone says, oh, queer or BIPOC, right? I I'm, I immediately just go, like, oh, that's cringe, right? But when someone says something like mocha, I, I'm like, yeah, that's the thing that was hip when I was a kid, right? Even though that's even fucking more cringe. And just... <laughs> that, that just... That's just how it goes, right? That's that's just how it goes. And it's just like you don't want to be like, oh, I'm born in the wrong generation, right? But like, the, the time where I was born was so actively repressive to any new forms of expression, and I guess to an extent, right now the world is still really repressive to new forms of expression, but not to the same degree, right? And. There, there was never really an opportunity for me to escape ontologies, right? Nothing presented like an alternative. And any alternative was actively derided, right? Anything new was automatically bad at that point. Because people were going through their own nostalgia, right? And those were the people with voices online. Because no one my age was just fucking like posting online, right? And no one offline was cool, you know, so... I can never get like a different perspective. Like, well, I I really like like I love it the song right and I I like all the fucking cheesy fucking pop music type shit right. But then people were like, oh, that's fucking cringe. That's fucking cringe because the people around me were like, oh, yeah, I'm an I'm a boomer larper like everyone else, and I was like, oh, that has to be cringe even though that's a good song. It's just a fucking good song.
and like young adult novels, right? I was really into young adult novels, and they were also like constantly derided. So I felt wrong for liking them, you know, because it, uh, oh, you have to, you have to consume old books, right? You have to fucking do whatever. And now, as an adult, right? As an adult, I can go like, yeah, young adult novels, they're just a commercialized product that exploits the fact that no one is making, like, actually valuable literature. But when you're, like, fucking 12, you don't want to read valuable literature. You want to read, oh, wow, uh, Girl Revolution, uh, Hunger Game, why we write this? You're not, you're not primed for valuable literature at that age. And I get it, right, fucking when adults go like, oh, wow, I like Harry Potter, that's my favourite thing. It's it's kind of cringy, but, like, that's just what they grew up on, right? It's like, fucking, when old people go like, yo, have you, ha have you seen Star Trek? That's what I grew up on, it's the best thing ever. It's the same fucking thing, except, like, that, that was just valued when we were kids, and, like, new stuff that wasn't valued, and... We're probably gonna do the same thing to the next generation, right? Like, when the next generation comes up with like, oh look, here's our new form of music, then we'll, we'll go like, oh, that's fucking cringe, why doesn't it sound like a hundred kicks? <laughs> Whatever the fuck. Because it's all, it's all a destructive cycle. It's being a human and being a part of culture is just bad. I'll never get to do it again to an extent, right? I'll never get to be a part of the new culture again. And there's something special with this, like, capitalistic no novelty, you might say, right? Because it, even though it's capitalistic, it's still novel, right? Even though it's destructive, it's still something new. And I know for a fact that as time goes on by, I'm going to get more and more stuck in the past. Even though I already am to a large extent. And... There's a de degree of, like, loneliness with that, right? Because when, when I was a kid, like, I could share culture with everyone, right? I could I could share culture with people old, older than me, right? I could share culture with people young, as, as old as me. There there wasn't anyone really younger than me, right? There was, oh, you're a year younger, right? You're basically my age. But but now there are, like, these fucking 14, 15-year-olds, right? Who have their own fucking cultures, and it's like, fucking... I don't share that, you know? I don't belong there, you know. I'm not like a... I, I don't use Instagram. I have no idea how to use Instagram. Only normies my age used Instagram. Now everyone uses Instagram, right? I don't, I don't know how to use TikTok. I don't know how to use the implements that the young people use to fucking generate culture, you know. So I'm gonna be a boomer fucking watching YouTube videos. I'm just gonna fucking eventually, like, I, I already do it, right, but, like, I'm just gonna keep perpetually going back to old YouTube videos and just watch it go. I have never seen these videos that were made fucking eight years ago. I guess that's what I'm watching now. I'm just watching fucking videos made eight years ago now. Because that's just how it fucking goes. Because YouTube is, like, YouTube for Zoomers, like, younger Zoomers... It's like fucking TV was for us when, when we were growing up. Like, yeah, yeah, some, some good programs are like, but we're not into TV, right? We're like, we're into YouTube. This is the cool new thing. And like, the younger Zoomers will be like, oh, yeah, YouTube. Yeah, there are good videos on there. But like, I'm, I'm into, I'm into like Instagram or TikTok or whatever the fuck, you know? Just a perpetual fucking cycle. It's a perpetual fucking cycle. And it's just all preserved in relics and artifacts. And... Like cyberspace, you know, you know how Rome, right, is elevated above its like natural level because just over time, roads got paved over again, right? Uh, buildings got paved over, right? And now you can dig down in Rome and find like archeo archaeological sites because it's all like preserved in like multiple layers. That's the fucking internet. Like they stopped doing it in real life, right? In real life now, they just tear things down before they build build something new, right? But on the internet, we have this fucking layers right that, that you can go down as much as you fucking want and it, time has fucking completely stopped mattering like like linear time was already like fucking under attack under postmodernism but linear time doesn't even make sense anymore linear time for all intents and purposes doesn't exist anymore and like that's just the reality we live in you know that's just 
the rule that we are part of. And you know, I'll fucking go to time war. I'll fucking, I'll fucking just exist outside of time. I don't fucking mind. I'll, I'll just have friends with me. You know, it's, it's, it's lonely, but you know, you fucking have friends, right? And with the young people, you can't relate to them. Who the fuck wants to be friends with a twelve-year-old anyway? I'm fucking. <laughs> I'm a time warrior. I'm a time warrior, and I'm gonna invade the fucking current era with my fucking boomer animal crossing let's plays. <laughs> oh okay, so this is going to be anticlimactic, right? Though this is the end of the fucking video. This was an anecdote that was supposed to flow somewhere in here, somewhere in this er area, right? I was supposed to convey this anecdote. But since I got so fucking taken aback by just the fucking wave of nostalgia, which complete accident, right? Oh, this is, oh yeah, yeah, Toads, might you have this video commenting on nostalgia, right? And then you just suddenly randomly get hit by nostalgia. It was an actual accident, I fucking swear. I, I, I'm not, I'm not that good of an actor. I don't plan things out that well, but yeah, there was one thing I wanted to say more, which was the, uh, which was when I was a kid, right? I also was making Let's Plays, right? But, but the issue is, it was really discouraged for kids to make Let's Plays. That's 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 one of the parts I really wanted to get to, and it was like the, uh, they, they suppressed the young people, whatever the fuck rent was going on, because one of the things I really hated was when kids with like low production value could make Let's Plays, and I, I think. A part of it is because it exposed the fact that their Let's Plays aren't like some special fucking form of art that's so full of effort, right? Because the only real distinction is that they had more personality and better mic qualities and then kids came up with their fucking shitty $5 mics, right, and squeaky voices and did essentially the same thing, right? And I, I think they got really annoyed at that. But yeah, after Banana Pie Lord, I got really into a northern lion who's also a hauntological he's a he's a person of hauntology, right? To an extent. Because he's he's been making the same fucking Isaac let's play for fucking ten years now. <laughs> so he himself is like just a crystallized piece of history to an extent. Oh damn, he has a luck be a landlord uh, video. I I really wanted to see that by him. So that's cool, I'm gonna watch those. This is just like a fun gambling game, it's not any anything serious. But yeah, anyway, uh, when I when I saw Northern Lions videos, I was like, oh, he's making videos about games that I can also play. So I played those games and I made Let's Plays of those games. And I used to make, like, so many fucking Let's Plays. I used to record for so long that my voice was hoarse at the end of the day, right? And that's an experience I'm all fucking too familiar with now. But as a kid, that was like a fucking, that was like a really cool thing to be like. It's like, oh, look, I, I put all of this effort in. Look, I can feel the fucking amount of energy put into these let's plays and that was a really rewarding experience as a kid because it, it, it didn't have any consequences, it didn't have any seriousness or severity it was just fun for the sake of fun and I could just fucking make a let's play and it, it was it was a good time it was it was a interesting experience so I just wanted to put that in the video because it would have been incomplete without that 